So I wanted to first make sure we uh, did proper introduction, so I wanted to introduce the film's director, Richard Pierce, on the, the far end here. know from Texas Heart Institute and uh, Music And the film's producer, Michael Burns. And <laughs> Tim, who was just introduced, and of course, Dr. Frazier. So thank you for your introduction to our wonderful challenges for producing sharing. So I thought I'd start by uh, just by asking you if you could explain in a little more detail about why you love this film so much. You know, it, it's it, it's amazing to me that this was done in the late 70s, or early 80s, when nobody was even thinking about a heart replacement with a total artificial heart. I started working on it in 1985. The bizarre thing, you know, uh, Plato and Socrates say that, you know, art imitates life, but this is a case where life is imitating art. I don't know if you noticed there was an emblem of the Texas Heart Institute in one of the scenes. And, uh, but it, it was, uh, uh, I think, at a time when we were doing more heart surgery than all of Western Europe at St. Luke's Hospital, because Dr. Cooley was such a, a master surgeon. And uh, it was a, uh, uh, I think, it, it sort of mimicked the Texas Heart Institute in, in many ways. But I thought uh, the, the concept, and nobody had the concept, this was before Barney Clark, yeah. first postal heart. So nobody really had the concept of a continuous flow <laughs> pump, and nobody, of course, thought it would work. But I think most of the people here will live to see the time that, we don't do heart transplants, we'll just put these pumps in. Can I, I'd like to talk to the director and producer about how this movie actually came about. I know James Salter was the screenwriter, who was a terrific journalist, and had also done a profile of Jarvik, I think, before the movie, correct? You... Um, yeah, the movie began with Salter, mm -hmm. um, a uh, great writer of, uh, of, of fiction, but someone who would also dabbled in the movies. Um, he wrote Downhill Racer for Robert Redford. Um, and uh, uh, he felt that in these characters that he saw, he, he got an assignment from, I thought it was look, Dick thinks it was life. Both, neither of them are digital, so you can't really find the archives, <laughs> okay? But he, he, he managed to get an assignment to look to uh, talk to the emerging superstars of medicine, who were uh, chest surgeons, guys who did bypass operations, valve operations, um, and were not only uh, you know because this is quite recent. I think the first uh, bypass in in America was in Boston in 1965. I believe, um, and then <laughs> when, uh, what? No, you mean the wrong. coronary bypass? Yeah, it was nineteen uh, sixty-five, and uh, he was at right. Methodist Hospital. Uh, Ed Garrett. With uh, oh, uh, Garrett. Yep. Ed Garrett did it. And oh, okay, there was a guy so, in Peter Bent Brigham in Boston yeah, who well, claimed he. he <laughs> I, I, um, but anyway, it sort of swept the country and <clears throat> Salter went across the country and interviewed many of the emerging superstars, including Dr. Cooley and um, the surgeon that Rob Jarvik, who designed the heart for this movie, uh, worked with in Salt Lake City, um, uh, William DeVries. Uh, and, uh, he just felt that there was a, a movie in it, and he knew about this artificial heart program that was um, um, sort of in its very, very early stages in Salt Lake City. And Jarvik was a kid. I mean, he might have been in his mid-20s when this began, and, and, uh, but was um, like 
you know, Tim's a fabulous inventor. Um, and that's the locus for the movie. Billy, uh, would you and Daniel like to show the, the Bible Corps and talk about the differences in what we saw? I mean, actually, it was interesting. There's similarities and differences. Yeah, I mean, just a just 50,000 foot view. So, okay, sure. So, so the movie in 1981 sort of outlines what's happened in the last seven, 10 years, yeah. seven to 10 years, just like they foretold in the movie. Every scene in that movie, sitting down at dinner with Fine, did you catch that? His last name was Fine, which is amazing because, uh, so it was, except it was Mattress Mac there to bring Daniel in. And Daniel was sitting across, I mean, every scene. Jeff Goldblum's uh, 34, I'm 34 at that time. He's yeah, he was 34. On, he's working on it 12 years, I'm working on it 12 years. Mattress Mac says, how old are you, Dan? I mean, it's, <laughs> the hair was standing up on the back of my neck every three minutes through that movie. Yeah. Um, so this device, uh, uh, Dr. Frazier came up with the idea of a continuous flow artificial heart. Had never seen the movie, and by the way, I wasn't really thrilled with the movie because I didn't know I was even going to med school at the time. And then roll forward 35 years and we're doing an experiment and I'm getting this weird deja vu vibe and I'm saying, I've seen a movie about what we're doing right now. Bud goes, oh no. Can I, can I stop you for, uh, for those of us who haven't seen the majority of their life on this, including me. Can you talk just briefly the difference between continuous flow and uh, what preceded? Pulse. Yeah, so all of your hearts, I'm guessing, uh, <laughs> fill and eject, fill and eject, fill and eject. It's a really nice way to pump blood, but your heart's two pumps, not one, right? One takes the venous blood and pumps to your lungs. The other one takes the bright red blood coming back from your lungs and pumps it to the body. And to be able to do that effectively, your heart has to pump 60 to 100 times a minute. 100 times a minute is 144,000 times a day. It's 52 million times a year. That's okay, because your heart can heal. If something tears, cells go and repair the damage. Not if it's plastic, though. And so there have been tons of plastic pumps that people have designed over the last 50 years to support the heart, even to replace it. But at 144 cycles every day that last a year, a year and a half, maybe two years on the outside. Roll forward to 2002, 2003, 2004, a company, Abiumed, spent a quarter of a billion dollars making the best pulsatile artificial heart in the world. And after 14 implants, five of which Bud did, the longest pump went 14 months before it broke, they gave up. So in 2004, it didn't look like we were ever going to have an artificial heart. Well, Bud came up with the idea of using a spinning turbine. Spin turbines are great ways to pump fluid. That's how in the oil industry and in car pump and gas pumps, everywhere that's what we use. But you give up the pulse. And you need, you need a pulse, right, to stay alive? We'll all assume that everybody here has a pulse. My dog has a pulse. Bud started doing the earliest experiments before anybody thought you could have a non-pulsatile pump in the blood and showed amazingly with Rich Wampler, another friend of ours, that you could use a rapidly spinning pump to, uh, to pump blood. Rob Jarvik was working on a continuous flow pump as well, but these were to support the heart. Right when I came back from Boston, Bud said, hey, really, let's see if we can take these continuous flow pumps and replace the heart. And it was um, an amazing period where we were realizing you don't need a pulse. And then in a rogue move, sort of like you just saw in this movie, the two of us put one in a patient who was dying and had no other options. It got a lot of public attention. It was in National Geographic, NPR. We did a TED Talk. It was on the cover of Popular Science. Enter Daniel Timms, who had been working on this device for a decade, who shows up, flew to Houston on his own dime, and explained his concept to us, and we realized it eliminated all the challenges that our twin turbine device had, specifically two computers talking to each other. The right pump was really vulnerable to clot, and he figured out this elegant, elegant device. We immediately pivoted away from twin turbine. We got Mattress Mac to write the check to bring the team to Houston, and this small army of brilliant people that were living all over the world. 
in South America, in Aachen, Germany, and Daniel had been traveling from city to city, sleeping on sofas, living on air, no wage. He would help them solve their problems on whatever project they were working on in exchange for them contributing their brilliance to this. And now we were able to put the band together. They moved to Houston. And now, roll forward six or seven years, this will be the first practical permanent artificial art. This is, uh, this is what you guys envision. It's much better than ours. <laughs> tell, tell them how it works. You want to do that? Yeah, sure. And talk, Daniel, if you could just tell them what the older hearts looked like, how much bigger they were, and who they could go in versus this. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I guess the, uh, the older hearts that, that we're talking about are probably two to three times the size of what Billy's holding up here. Um, they couldn't fit any, in any women and children and only large um, male adults. Uh, would be able to be supported with those devices, whereas this device would be able to fit in a 12-year-old child. And uh, it certainly can pump enough blood for an adult um, male exercising, so it's all doing that with uh, you know, a rapidly spinning disc that is magnetically levitated, so there's no wearing out inside there. So that means that it can keep going and going and going, like they say in the movie, it's not going to stop. This is not going to stop. And uh, so for that reason, you know, we can remove the, remove the native heart and uh, put this in its place. Um, and you know, eliminate that uh, that problem of, of heart failure uh, as it's going along. But you know, I mean, what, when we were watching this movie as a <coughs> group, our team of engineers, we only seen this a couple of years ago as well. It actually convinced us that there's time travel. There is definitely time travel. And someone in our group has gone back and told them the script because we're watching this and we're following the movie to see what's happening. Next. <laughs> <laughs> and we didn't know that. This was our audience right here. Yeah, right. <laughs> Absolutely. One of the things that I thought was interesting in the movie and that I saw in my research was that people were so frightened uh, in 1969 with the first implant that they wouldn't be who they were anymore. And there was all of that concern with transplants, if you put. When the character asked what color is the guy who, whose heart he got, can you talk a little bit about that? Would you like to address that? Uh, that's, that's what people worry about if they're healthy. Yes. <laughs> you know, it, but the, nearly the first thing the transplant patient right. will say when they wake up is, I can breathe. You know, they want to breathe. That's a, we, we all reach our time, uh, but, and we have different modes, but, being slowly suffocated, which is what the heart failure patient has to face, I, they don't really care about uh, any of those things that are, are philosophical, if, as I said, if you're not sick. But uh, I can breathe, that's the first thing you hear from them. And with the smaller pumps as well. And the truth of it is, your heart is just a muscle there's no emotional content, but as humans, we feel it respond to our emotion, and we think it's somehow involved. It, of course, isn't. Uh, uh, I was once on Dateline, and they said, you're holding someone's beating heart in your hand. What's it feel like? And I said, a lot like the spleen, but it wiggles around a bit. <laughs> did you have any issues with that when you were doing the movie? Were there, did Salter feel any different? I realize he wasn't a doctor, but if he had a different idea. If, if Salter had, about I'm the, sorry. whether the heart is a muscle or whether it's connected to something larger. Hmm. I think, I, I don't know the answer to what Jim felt. Um, so he would be great if he was here, he died. Um, year and a half ago or so. Two years. Two Was years it ago. something you all looked at when you were doing the movie? We thought it, it, that her her emotion mm -hmm. had to um, be dealt with in some way. Even though, even back then, I agree with Bud mm -hmm. totally that people um, who are sick yeah. and are helped mm -hmm. are not um, as anywhere near as um, as emotionally 
uh, hooked in as you think they would be, okay? Um, but I think we did have to figure out some way, and, and I, I, we did it, maybe not enough, but we did deal with her recovery, and it wasn't a recovery based on her being well, it was a recovery based on her adjusting to having, you know, a smooth running pump in her chest. Do you want to talk a little about Allie? You, I mean, you have a patient. Well, I think that's just, just a perfect example as a healthy young girl. You know, you think, uh, well, there's some cause for it to eat too much bacon or something. The bulk of them are what we call idiopathic, which is the same derivatives as idiot. It's, if we don't know what caused them. This is a healthy young girl who was on the A&M rowing team, of all things. I don't know they had any water up there, but somehow <laughs> they, have, they have a rowing team. And she was active and healthy, and she came in, and she was dying of heart failure. And uh, we, uh, uh, it, was, it was interesting to me because it, it was one of those experiences I remember when I was a medical student, uh, we had a young Italian boy who I got to know before his surgery and he needed a valve replacement and I, uh, uh, I thought he'd do well and Dr. DeBakey operated on him, he looked like he was doing well and a real nice young kid, 19 years old, really looking forward to a new life with a new valve and his heart stopped. And uh, I was the youngest and strongest at that time. This was 1965, 66. So they got me to massage his heart. And, and as long as I massaged his heart, he looked up at me, you know, and even reached up at one time. But, but we couldn't get the heart to stop. And, and uh, Dr. Bakey came in and finally said for us to quit. And I, or I couldn't quit, of course, as a young that I was, and finally the resident just hit me and knocked me off. But I was thinking, if my hand could keep this boy alive, why couldn't we do something that would do the same thing? And it was, it was sort of interesting with this young girl initially, when we brought her into the operating room, her heart stopped, and uh, I had to massage her heart, and I massaged it, and we put her on the heart-lung machine with, through her a leg, and uh, we had a pump that we pulled off the shelf, just like I, I wished I'd had in 1965, and it worked. And she's alive and well today. And uh, I think it's just, uh, it's been a lot of, lot of work. And it's one thing that I think people in Houston don't even realize, all really work has been done here of any merit with, any, with this uh, technology. I've worked with, I had to work with companies in different parts of, one was in Sacramento and one was in New York, because we didn't have any companies here that were even involved in medical progress, despite, despite the fact we had the largest medical center in the world. But uh, it, it was um, a great satisfaction to me looking back on my life when, when thinking back to that uh, young Italian boy that, uh, and, and uh, this young woman is about 10 years out now and doing fine. And uh, I think if we hadn't developed that technology, it would have been just like it was in 1965. So well, I have a, a question about that, which is about medical experimentation. In the movie, they have to go, they have to meet with one small group of people in the hospital. And it's like, okay, we're gonna go do it. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about what kind of hoops you all now have to jump through to get something like this in a patient? Well, I don't know. Billy, you want to talk about that? Not know. really. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, it to what I, 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 I will say, in, in, in all fairness, the device we put in Craig Miller, Lewis. Uh, Craig Lewis, I'm sorry. Craig Miller, <laughs> surgeon in Stanford. Who uh, needs a device? Oh, here. Uh, the, the artificial heart that we put in Craig Lewis uh -huh. was. Emergency made out of uh, other components that were approved. Two LVADs, hernia mesh, 
some medical silicone, some Dacron cardiovascular patches, maybe not for that exact indication, and you're sort of allowed to do that. We were sort of in a gray zone, and we decided to ask for forgiveness instead of permission. In fact, when he went and sat in that room asking those guys for permission to use the device, I thought, oh man, big mistake. Yeah. Uh, right? Yeah. And, and you're allowed to do that twice, right? Yeah. Uh, so, so for this device, mm -hmm. we've actually met in person with the FDA. We've had long calls with them most recently, two weeks ago. Uh, so we're doing this by the books. Uh, uh, so, but, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, the FDA is trying to make it easier to do first in man in the United States with an early feasibility study program. And they're, they're all for innovation, but they want to do it safely and, and, and wisely. I have, I have one more question for you all. Can I, can I give a prop to you guys, though? Sure. My wife will tell you that whenever I watch medical shows, I go, it's never that way. That is so stupid. He, he can't do that and that. Oh, they would never. And I walk out of the room or throw things at the TV. <laughs> that movie really is the most accurate depiction of life as a heart surgeon. Every aspect of it uh, is so accurate. Being on my podcast, shock in the heart, the affect in the OR, everything. That said, after they give the diazepam, they turn the stopcock the wrong way. <laughs> when you do CPR, you don't do five beats and pause if someone's ventilating for you. That's only in CPR. It was a period piece. You saw it was a Borg Shiley valve. Yeah. It was taken off the market the year your uh, movie came out. <laughs> Well, and that, like, like, a coronary angiogram you showed showed left vein had nothing to do with the valves. But other than that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 Ross, did I get it all right? Yeah. Okay. What did you do to get that right? What did you do? Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> well, we spent some time here uh, at the Texas Heart Institute. Um, and... Uh, um, we vetted what we were going to do to through a lot of doctors and stuff and we had people on the set you know making sure that we didn't make horrible mistakes <laughs> the mistakes you're talking about are you know um, probably probably would have killed them but, <laughs> <laughs> but other than that yeah, yeah. Um, so we we did our very best we're we're you know not doctors, um, but we tried hard. I have an aesthetic question. Um, my husband and I've been watching a lot of detective shows, and there's a lot of violins that come in, often at the wrong time. And I, this movie had no suspenseful music at all. Was that? Did you decide to let the story tell itself to not get in the way? What? That's a good question because one of the, I mean, in a way, in order to get a movie like this made, mm -hmm. it has to end up being something that can be put into a sentence, will the girl live yeah. or die, mm -hmm. you know, at the first artificial heart operation. And yet we didn't want to make one of those melodramatic yeah. medical movies. Okay, so, because this is really not so much about whether the girl will live or die, even though that's part of the movie, it's about a lot of the complicated issues around uh, taking an action like this okay. and, and looking very closely at a surgeon and a surgeon's world and a surgeon's emotional connection to patients and all of this, um, which was, I think, not going to fit into the mold of a, yeah. a medical melodrama or, or a TV procedural, medical procedural. So part of the problem was to keep the audience from getting it, it becoming too simplified and too melodramatic. So this was a very much, I mean, we may have gone overboard. I, I do feel like this is our audience. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is an audience of doctors who look at this movie and go, yeah, it, for the most part, this is the way it is. Mm -hmm. And that's what we dreamed about. We dreamed that we would make a movie that people could say that's actually the way it is. And particularly, that's the way it is for a heart surgeon like Dan Cooley or Bud, Bud Frazier. That this is what this is their, their life, in a way. I think it was a remarkable, uh, the operative depictions, I don't know how you did it, I don't know, I guess you had a sheep or a goat or something, 
but uh, it was really remarkable. Uh, you know how we, well we were, we were determined to be able to have an audience look into the body of an open heart yeah. surgery and not and not cheat that really to see a heart and to see what what the miracle of what a heart looks like inside the body and to see it in a way that we began to see it as as beautiful not scary okay we were Determined. We hope it's beautiful, not scary. Oh. You, you would be the ones yeah. to tell us. Because it was somebody saying. But the lines were the, the same lines that you would have said in surgery. I guess you picked them up when he was down here yeah. with Dr. Cooley, but that was, yes. it was just uh, right out of the OR. It was all super accurate. <laughs> beautiful. Go up, but go down. Flowing two liters, flowing three liters. Yeah, that was adequate. And I sort of Total. wanted to comment on They hardly de-aired it all. The table was so much smaller <laughs> than yours. On the melodramatic aspects. I don't think you can do both. I don't think you can be accurate and invite people into this process and also provide a melodramatic, um, is she going to live, is she going to die? You know, you, you, you violate there's a sort of membrane between the two mm -hmm. and and so you know if you feel the film is is slightly less melodramatic than it would be that's intentional yeah. Yeah, that worked really well well thank you all very Let's much see if anybody has any questions yeah. Anyway. Nope. yeah how does a movie like this disappear because it was very hard for us to get a print to show it to yeah. What happened with In a nutshell, um, you know, it's always a longer story. 20th Century Fox was excited about the film based on its Toronto Film Festival opening and then got scared, showed it to some people, you know, and were nervous about it and basically held it for a couple of years or at least a year and a half. And then Barney Clark's yeah. operation happened. Yeah. And they said, oh my god, we have something here. And did the exact wrong thing and tried to uh, 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 say, here's, our, here's the new movie. You know what I mean? Based on Barney Clark. And it really had nothing to do with Barney Clark. And Barney Clark actually left pe many people anyway with a very sour yeah. taste. So that's the story of its U.S. distribution. And it had, it had I, was saying, I was saying earlier today, it had the, the most famous for me mm -hmm. um, last line in the New York Times review, a kind of, um, I, I can't imagine, the, the article, the review, Vincent Canby wrote in the last sentence was the review, anybody interested in the future of heart surgery should see this movie. Talk about damning with faint praise. There's, there's never going to be a free line that is. <laughs> I would like to say, since it's a Houston. Oh, uh, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Sorry. No, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. As the inventor, as you, you went from two turbines to one, essentially, how do you get the two circulations to work with only one turbine? <laughs> Very good question. Uh, on either side of that turbine are different blades that pump to the, bo uh, to the body and to the lung. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. 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 It says one moving part. Actually, you know what? I've got one in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> that, so it, it pumps on both sides? Correct, yes. One spinning disc and on one side the blades that pump to the lung and the other side pump to the body. So just one spinning disc there. And uh, that's the, uh, yeah, that's the heart of the heart. So they're different size blades or something? Correct, yeah, the different size blades. So you get the different pressure on the one side, you exactly get a right. blade. Exactly Correct, yeah. The, the lower pressure for the lung is a smaller diameter on this side here, you can see, yeah. and a larger diameter for the, for the rest of the body. The most remarkable thing about this, and Daniel, I don't think, even thought about it because he designed it. We've never been able to make a continuous flow pump that had a, what we call a starling response. Like, you're sitting there, your heart will only pump so much blood. And, but if you climb three flights of stairs, it'll pump more. 
because it needs more. Well, the heart's had a million years to figure that out, but we've never been able to do it with these pumps. But this pump actually does it, just like that. We can put the calves on a treadmill and the pump will be pumping 10 liters. The calves require a lot more blood than the human. And it'll go up to 15 liters without changing the RPM or the speed of the with pump. Exercise, yeah. It just has to deal with the position of that uh, disc relative to the computers and the housing. So it's, it's a quite a remarkable thing. One of the really uh, super brilliant things that Daniel uh, came up with is while this is spinning in the air, not spinning in the blood but not touching anything, there's three electromagnets that are adjusting the strength that they pull 20,000 times a second to keep the thing floating in space. But 2,000 times a second, it makes a decision about does it need to pull this rotor a little this way or a little that way? And when I say a little, 600 microns, less than a millimeter, but it changes the relative strength of these two pumps. So 2,000 times a second it says, what is the patient doing now? Are they coughing? Are they digesting? Are they standing up? Are they lying down? Are they straining to go to the bathroom? It makes the appropriate adjustments much faster than any of our hearts do. And everybody in here has a cardiac output between probably four and six and a half liters a minute. This will do 26 liters a minute. Uh, I always joke, and Bud always rolls his eyes, at the 2,200 Olympics, there's going to be stock and modified. 